Good afternoon. I'm Sally Cummins. I'm Vice President of Sustainable Nutrition Affairs at National Dairy Council. And we're excited that you've joined us for the fourth webinar in the Dairy Nurses Life webinar series. This quarterly series addresses a range of topics related to dairy's role in health and sustainable food systems to help practitioners like yourself navigate the evolving health and wellness landscape. Before we get started, I just wanted to share a few reminders. For optimal viewing and audio experience, please use Google Chrome or Fox, Firefox as your browser. And if you have any technical difficulties, just use the chat window on the left side of the screen and a representative will respond and assist you. And also, if you have any questions that pop up during the course of the webinar, go ahead and type those in the window as well, and we'll address all questions as time allows at the end. Lastly, if you're following along on social media, please use the hashtag Dairy Nourishes Life. And we'll be sure to send out continuing education certificates, handouts, and a reference list within 24 hours, and you'll be able to find the webinar recording on nationaldairycouncil.org next week. For those of you not familiar with National Dairy Council, NDC is a nonprofit organization founded in 1915 by dairy farmers because they believed in science and the importance of understanding how dairy foods might benefit human nutrition and health. Today, NDC represents about 40,000 dairy farm families across the U.S., as well as dairy importers. And on behalf of America's dairy farmers, our diverse team of scientists, registered dietitians and communications professionals strive to bring to life the dairy community's shared vision of a healthy, happy, sustainable world with science as our foundation. And this is more relevant today than ever before as we're challenged with not just feeding but nourishing nearly 10 billion people around the globe while honoring our planet and resources. We're at a really important fusion of personal health and planetary health, and we need to think about nutrition and food systems from multiple dimensions that make up sustainability, health, social, economic, and environmental. And the body of science, innovation, and continuous progress indicates that dairy can play a vital role in being part of the solution when it comes to health and sustainable food systems. We've addressed many topics related to these dimensions of sustainability on our previous webinars. And over the course of this series, we've received over 240 questions. So today, we're really thrilled you've joined us as we address the topic of categories and questions we've received to help practitioners navigate this landscape. Today, we'll cover different types of cow milk in the dairy case, hormones, dairy farming, and human health, lactose intolerance and milk allergy, cow care and antibiotics, and the dairy's commi dairy community's commitment to sustainability. So I'm thrilled to be joined today by our three speakers, Abigail Andrew Copenhaver. Abby is a registered dietitian and nutritionist and a dairy farmer with an 800 cow, 15,000 acre dairy farm in Stanley, New York. In, in 2014, she started Farmstead Nutrition and Consulting focusing on agriculture production, food technology, nutrition, and fitness-related services. Abby holds a bachelor's degree in animal science and human nutrition and dietetics from Cornell University and Buffalo State College, and a master's in agriculture, food science, and management from Washington State University. In terms of disclosure, Abby is a National Dairy Council ambassador and a Team Chocolate Milk member competing and running in triathlon races, including 70.3 and 140.6 Ironman distances. That's pretty impressive. We're also joined by Dr. Moises Torres Gonzalez, who's the Director of Nutrition Research at National Dairy Council. Dr. Torres Gonzalez is a subject matter expert on whole fat dairy foods, cardiometabolic health, milk fat ingredients, inflammation, and cognition. He's earned a bachelor's degree in biochemical engineering with majors in biotechnology and food technology at the Instituto Tecnologico de Colombia as well as a master's degree in biochemical engineering and both master's and doctor doctoral degrees in nutritional sciences at the University of Connecticut. We're also joined by Dr. Amy, Amy Boilo, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at National Dairy Council. Dr. Boilo works to ensure the scientific accuracy and regulatory compliance and communication materials for National Dairy Council. She has a PhD in nutritional sciences from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she also completed an internship in clinical dietetics. And she's completed a postdoctoral fellowship in cardiovascular disease genetics at the University of Cincinnati. 
So some of the most common questions we've received through the webinar series and other engagements is, help me understand the different types of milk in the dairy case, and should, what should I be recommending to the people I work with as well as my family and friends? So today, Dr. Boylo is going to help us wrap our head around the variety of options in the dairy case. So to start with, Amy, what is the difference between whole fat, 2%, 1%, and skim milk? Yeah, Sally, so today we're using terms like 2% milk and 1% milk as household names. And before we dive into the specifics and the differences, I think it's important to note that whole milk, 2% milk, 1% milk, and skim milk, those four different types, all provide the same package of nine essential nutrients. So regardless of the fat content, you will still get the same high quality protein and there's no difference in the vitamin and mineral content. So let's get into the milk. So there are four standard fat levels standardized for milk, and most of us are familiar with their names. So on the slide you can see whole milk, 2% milk, 1%, and skim milk or non-fat milk. And yes, they all differ in fat level. So while whole milk contains 3.25% milk fat on a weight basis, let's so said differently, that's 3.25 grams of fat per 100 grams of whole milk. The, the others contain the percentages you can see there. The Food and Drug Administration has standards of identity for milk that requires milk to have not less than 3.25% fat. So we're gonna add a little animation here. For whole milk, this means that whole milk has eight grams of fat per cup, as you can see on the slide. For 2% milk, there are five grams of fat per cup. And this is also called reduced fat milk, incorporating a nutrient content claim into that name. 1% milk has 2.5 grams of fat per cup, and this is also called low-fat milk, again, a nutrient content claim incorporated. And for skim milk, there's only a trace amount of fat remaining, which below which we're not required for labeling, so we refer to that as fat-free or non-fat milk. And it's important also to know that processors can offer these standardized levels of fat in milk by using separation technology that allows them to remove the cream or milk fat really pretty easily, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, in raw milk, for example, fat slowly rises to the top, and by applying a small amount of centrifugal force, this fat or cream can be separated from the milk. The process itself is called centrifugal separation, and the cream then can be added back to the milk in the correct amounts to meet the standards promised on the label and desired by consumers. Uh, following that process, then pasteurization, really important, uh, will ensure that milk is safe. And then homogenization, if you've heard that term before, ensures that the fat globules that are in the milk are small enough to prevent them from re congealing and rising to the top of the container and reforming that cream layer. When fat globules through homogenization are sufficiently small, the natural forces of fluid friction and their surface charge prevent them from rising to the top and reforming that cream layer. So again, for each of the four types of milk, there's a different amount of fat, but they all contain the same high quality protein, which is eight grams per cup. And other than fat, the other nutrients are are the same. Now fat of course contributes calories, so you see that there are caloric differences between the milks. However, regardless of fat content, they are all a good or excellent source of nine essential nutrients. And it's because of milk's unique and rich uh, nutrient package that the American or the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Heart Association, uh, four highly respected organizations, under the leadership of Healthy Eating Research and supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, recently issued consensus guidelines and consensus beverage guidelines. These guidelines noted that there are two go-to beverages for children ages one to five, and those two go-to beverages are milk and water. In addition, in the consensus statement, the organizations noted that plant-based dairy alternatives are not recommended as complete substitutes for dairy milk 
for young children, and this is for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is the nutrient content and the fortification of plant-based alternatives varies quite widely. The other reason is that the nutrients that are fortified in plant-based alternatives may not be as bioavailable from plant-based alternatives as they are from cow's milk itself. With the exception of fortified soy milk, these milks are not adequate nutritional substitutes for dairy milk, which has many essential nutrients for healthy growth and development. Some plant-based non-dairy milks do have added nutrients, such as calcium and vitamin D, but the amounts really do vary by type and brand, and evidence does suggest that our bodies may absorb nutrients from plant milks not as well as they do from dairy milks. Now, if you think through then in the case of lactose intolerance, which Abby is going to speak to here soon, there is wide availability at retail for lactose-free unflavored milk, um, which is important to keep in mind. In the case of milk allergy or families who choose to avoid animal products, unsweetened and fortified non-dairy milks such as soy may be a good choice, but it's really important to consult with a pediatrician or a registered dietitian nutritionist to choose a milk substitute for your child and discuss how his or her overall diet has enough of the key nutrients found in milk such as protein, calcium, and vitamin D. So if you are looking for resources for education or to better understand the nutritional trade-offs, NDC does have some handy flashcards. They are found on the National Dairy Council website at nationaldairycouncil.org, and they provide at-a-glance nutritional and ingredient information on cow's milk and various dairy alternatives, such as soy, rice, almond, coconut, and cashew beverages. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Amy. So you brought up two other points we get questions about quite a bit. Lactose-free milk, and how does it differ from non-lactose-free milk? And as you mentioned, Abby's going to address that later, so we'll just hold all questions on that for her um, to address, because she's going to get to that. Um, but can you talk to us a little bit more about pasteuriz pasteurization, and does it change the nutritional content of milk? I'd be happy to. So terms like milk pasteurization may be unfamiliar to some folks, and there are folks also out there who even question the purpose of pasteurization. Uh, from cow to cup, the U.S. dairy industry follows many strict government regulations, and pasteurization is one of those, and it's important. Uh, pasteurization is important to ensure that the milk we drink is safe. So pasteurization, you asked, Sally, um, it's a simple effective method that kills harmful pathogens through heat treatment, importantly, without affecting the taste or the nutritional value of the milk. So pasteurization is recognized world, around the world. Um, it's an essential tool for protecting public health, and it was first introduced in 1864. That's 150 years ago. It, the process, as some of you may know, was named after the famous French scientist Louis Pasteur. A few de decades after Pasteur invented the process, a New Jersey milk plant would be the first to install the pasteurizer in the United States. Since that time and through today, with the exception of milk that's marketed as raw, um, which is milk that's unpasteurized, all milk in the United States has been pasteurized. And this process is one of the ways that the U.S. dairy industry helps ensure that our milk is safe. So let's get a little bit technical. How is milk pasteurized? So in most milk processing plants, chilled raw milk is heated by passing it between heated stainless steel plates or heat exchangers until it reaches a temperature of 161 degrees Fahrenheit. It's then held at that temperature for at least 15 seconds before it's very quickly cooled back to the original temperature of 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And according to the Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, Raw milk can harbor dangerous bacteria that can pose serious health risks to you and your family. The milk pasteurization process kills those bacteria. So to the question that we get, does pasteurization change the milk? Now, while there are some groups that believe pasteurization destroys the unique qualities of milk, I will tell you this is simply not true. According to the CDC, pasteurization does not significantly change the nutritional value of milk. In fact, you can get all the nutritional benefits of drinking pasteurized milk without the risk of illness that comes with drinking raw milk. When it comes to milk's nutrients, 
all of milk's minerals stay exactly the same through pasteurization. There is one small change that we could mention here that pertains to the vitamins. Raw milk contains a minuscule amount of vitamin C, which doesn't survive the pasteurization process. But in this case, the amount of vitamin C that is in cow's milk prior to pasteurization is so small that we wouldn't even be able to refer to that milk as a good source of vitamin C in the first place. So we just reviewed pasteurization, 161 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds. There is another option that we're gonna talk briefly is ultra high temperature pasteurization. So this is the process of heating milk to 280 degrees Fahrenheit for two seconds followed by rapid cooling. This process results in milk that is 99.9% .9 free from bacteria, which is a five log kill, and creates an extended shelf life for products that's up to three times the length of normal pasteurization. So once ultra-pasteurized product is open, it then can become contaminated with spoilage bacteria, um, so it needs to be refrigerated. So in the, in the case of regular pasteurization, uh, milk, when it's properly refrigerated, can last from 12 to 21 days after pasteurization, while ultra-high temperature pasteurized milk um, can last 30 to 90 days, which is a long time. Awesome. So another common question we get is, what's the difference in organic and conventional milk? And should I be choosing one over the other? Sure. So what a lot of people don't realize is that organic, the term organic has to do with farming practices as opposed to the nutritional content of milk. In addition to that, the term organic is actually not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration or FDA. It's not a health claim, it's not a nutritional claim. Organic refers to a method of raising and growing food rather than to referencing any nutritional advantages a food may have. So you ask, what is organic milk? It is milk that is labeled USDA organic. It also meets the USDA's National Organic Program Standards and also has been certified as organic. So the USDA itself does not conduct these certifications. There are a number of third-party organic certified organizations that can conduct the required audits of the farm and the, the, the supply chain. The certifying organizations that, that perform this work um, are do have to be accredited by USDA. So let's talk some specifics, under the USDA National Organic Program standards, organic dairy farmers must demonstrate, among other things, that the following is true. Their, their cows have a minimum of 120 days per year of pasture access, whereby 30% of that cow's food intake comes directly from grazing during the season when this is possible. All the feeds that are provided to the cows must be organically grown, and the cows cannot be treated with antibiotics or hormones. Yet people may not still fully understand the meaning of organic, so let's just take a little deeper look. All right, so a question that we get a lot, and I know, Sally, we've talked about this, is whether or not organic milk is more nutritious than conventional milk. It's been a topic of conversation for years. It's turns out it's been a topic of research investigation for years as well. And I can tell you, having looked into this, that it is possible to take an individual study from the literature and say, yes, there is a difference, a compositional difference between organic milk and conventional milk. But when one looks at the body of literature out there, it quickly becomes evident that there are so many variables that impact the nutritional composition of milk, not just the farming practices. These factors include the diet that the cows are eating, the breed of the cow influences the milk composition, genetic variability, the stage of lactation, the season or the weather that the, the herd is in, and any interactions between these factors can also impact the nutritional composition of milk. Because of all of these variables, what we realize is that it's nearly impossible to isolate the the single variable of organic farming practices versus non-organic non in order to identify a real difference. I'll give you a, an illustration here. So in a 2015 invited review 
Uh, the authors summarized the results of a number of studies that were designed to evaluate differences in the fat content, total fat content in milk. And they found organic versus conventional milk. They found three studies reported higher total fat in organic milk. Three studies reported higher total fat in conventional milk. And then further three studies found that there was no difference. So that just gives you a little illustration about um, the variability and the impact on nutri nutrient composition. So there are individual fatty acids, on the other hand, are probably the most commonly studied um, composition uh, difference between milk. And we hear claims, we often hear claims about organic milk being higher in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, published comparisons for omega-3 fatty acid content of organic versus conventional milk do support that there is a difference which is attributed to the diet that the cows are consuming overall. It's important to remember that milk, regardless of its organic certification status, is not a good dietary source of omega-3 fatty acids, unless the milk is intentionally fortified um, with omega-3 fatty acids by the processor. So let's take a look at a little illustration here, give us some perspective. So in this graph that you see, if we compare 100 calories of milk organic versus conventional to the same 100 calories from salmon, you can see that it is going to take anywhere from 26 to 38 times more milk than salmon to deliver the same omega-3 dose from really just a modest amount of fish. So you can see a marginal difference in organic and conventional, but, but fish really stands out here. So milk, good or excellent source, of nine essential nutrients, and it is actually important for helping Americans to get enough calcium, vitamin D, and even potassium, but unless it's been fortified by the processor, it is simply not a reliable good source for omega-3 fatty acids. So if you are looking for omega-3 fatty acids in your diet, I will rec recommend the fish. That's awesome, Amy. Thank you. That really gives us a lot of insight in terms of the variables that go into um, milk and its composition, as well as really being cognizant of different foods providing different nutrients when you're looking um, at building a healthy diet. Really appreciate that. So we also get similar questions about grass-fed dairy. Can you shed a little light on that? Absolutely. Happy to. So similar to organic, your milk that's labeled as grass-fed does not refer to the quality of the milk. Rather, it refers to the diets that farmers have chosen to feed their cows. Grass-fed does not necessarily mean that cows solely get their food from pasture, but that they have access to pasture during the growing seasons where that's possible based on geography and weather. So let's take a step back and, and think about the practical application here. It's really hard to graze in snow. <laughs> so if you're in Vermont, Wisconsin, um, big dairy states, it, the, the grazing is going to be limited, um, but they can still be grass-fed. So in the context of dairy, grass feeding means that the feed source is grass and forage. Grass can include annuals and perennials, and forage refers to plant materials that be, can be grazed on in the field and also plants that can be harvested for food. In the case of grass-fed, that will exclude the grain corn, the corn, grains such as corn. Now, while you see grass-fed on labels of milk and other dairy foods, it's important to note there are no federal standards or regulations that define grass-fed dairy foods. But there are independent certifiers. For example, the American Grass-Fed Association recently approved new grass-feeding standards or grass-fed standards. And according to these standards, cows must graze on pasture no less than 150 days and have an average of at least 60% of their feed consumption from pasture grazing. Either way, any grass-fed claims made on food labels must be truthful and not misleading. It's important, though, to note that most cows in the United States don't exclusively eat one or the other, not all grass or all grain. Rather, in practice, farmers work very closely with trained animal nutritionists, they consult with veterinarians, and they devise diets that are based on the specific needs of the cows in the herd. This diet's referred to as a total mixed ration, and our first webinar of the year, our speaker, Dr. Tricarico, went into great detail on this, and we'll be sure you have access to that. So it's a big topic area. Great, so we're also receiving more questions about A2 beta casein milk. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yep, yeah, let's go there. So the first point I wanna share is that milk that's labeled A2 and conventional milk 
they share the same nutrient package. So regardless of your choice, you're getting the same nutrients. The major difference between the two types of milk is in the protein. So milk provides high quality protein and it comes in two forms, casein and whey. We hear a lot about whey when we talk about sports nutrition and when you're enjoying cheese and eating cheese, you're eating casein. In the case of A2 milk, it's the casein component of the protein that, that might be a bit different here. A major type of casein in milk is called beta casein. And cows predominantly produce two isoforms, alpha-1 and alpha-2, or alpha-1 and alpha-2 beta casein. Uh, most milks contain a mixture roughly 50-50% of A1 and A2 beta casein, while cows that are producing only A1 are used for what is labeled as A2 milk. So certain cow breeds can produce predominantly A2 beta casein with very little A1. So milk comprised of only a, or predominantly A2 beta casein is an active topic of clinical investigation. And really what investigators are looking at is evaluating whether or not individuals with lactose intolerance or malabsorption are going to be better able to digest this type of milk. And there's actually a study published within the last couple of weeks in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that suggests that there may be people that for, for which this may be the case. So the current hypothesis is that milk containing predominantly A2 beta casein may be better tolerated by individuals with lactose intolerance. And to date, there have been a total of four published studies to evaluate the hypothesis. And while there are some data to support, we really do need some more evidence um, before making a definitive conclusion. And I am aware that there are studies ongoing to answer this question. But regardless, it's important to point out that A2 milk provides the same nutrient-rich package as the conventional milk of A1, A2 um, beta casein. So in closing, I hope that I've been successful in illustrating that there are numerous options in the dairy case. So there's a milk for everybody, and regardless of what type of milk you prefer, know that it's nutrient-rich, safe, and wholesome. And really, when it comes down to it, the best milk is the kind that your family will drink. Thanks so much, Amy. That really, I think, addressed a lot of the questions that we have received over the course of the year. And you alluded to lactose-free as another option we see in the dairy case, so I'm really thrilled that we have Abby Copenhaver here with us. As I mentioned, she's a dietitian and a dairy farmer, and she can provide a little bit more information into the topic of lactose intolerance and milk allergy. So, Abby, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sally. I'm more than happy to be here today because, one, I uh, love dairy, I'm very passionate about all things dairy, and, two, anytime I can answer questions surrounding um, all the questions with dairy and um, for our health professionals, I'm more than happy to do so. So I do have my disclosure slides here for you guys to look at, but let's jump right into lactose intolerance versus milk allergy. Uh, many people use allergy, intolerance, the word sensitivity really interchangeably. But again, as health professionals, we know there's a big difference between the management and the actual science between an allergy or intolerance. So on this slide here, I really just have the two contrasts together. So with lactose intolerance, we're talking about it's a sensitivity to the milk sugar known as lactose in our milk and milk products. And it's really specific to the GI tract. That's where the response is going to happen. It happens upon um, digestion of lactose, and it's really due to the lack of the enzyme lactase to be able to break down that lactose so that we can absorb it through our small intestines. It's actually pretty rare in children. So um, sometimes you might hear parents saying, oh, my child has to avoid dairy because they have a lactose allergy or they might reverse that again and say they have an intolerance to the protein. So really it, it leads, you need to ask more follow-up questions to clarify what it actually is and if they've actually been diagnosed by a primary care physician or, or an immunologist. So again, rare in children, um, it is very individualized from person to person because the, the sensitivity to the milk sugar can vary from person to person. You even had some people that might be um, lactose intolerance but not really exhibit any symptoms. Um, and we will see in a couple slides, there's actually certain demographics uh, with a higher prevalence of lactose intolerance. So when you compare that to an actual milk allergy, 
We're talking about the milk protein, specifically casein in milk that, that you're triggering an immune response to. So you're talking about not just centralized to, to your gastrointestinal tract, like with lactose intolerance. You're talking about an actual immune um, response to that protein that's being triggered. It does actually occur in young children around toddler age, but it they can grow out of it, and they usually do, but it is definitely something that you would be working with a healthcare provider um, and a doctor, immunologist, to work through that with your youngsters um, before they could get, get back into dairy to make sure that they have actually grown of it. Unfortunately, with milk allergy, though, it does require just avoiding um, milk and milk products um, unless that allergy is grown out of. So moving on to the actual nitty-gritty science of what is lactose intolerance, on the left here I actually have the clinical definition of lactose intolerance, but I'm going to walk through the definition with you uh, with the visual on your right. So some of you might see this chemistry and, and think back to your collegiate days when, when you're taking your nutrition classes, which is great. So when we think carbohydrates, right, we have simple and complex. Our lactose actually falls under a simple carb. It's considered a disaccharide, and it's glucose and galactose, those two monosaccharides that are bonded together to create that disaccharide, those two molecules. Now, in order for us to absorb it and to be able to utilize it in our bodies, we have to break that bond so that we can absorb it through our intestine walls. And we, we require lactase to be able to do that. So if we uh, either have GI um, acute injury or if we're actually lactose intolerant, um, that's going to affect your ability to produce that enzyme, which is ultimately going to uh, affect your ability to be able to absorb lactose. So it will then travel on into your, your colon um, where you'll see a lot of your symptoms crop up because your, your bacteria that live there, those great guys that we really, really like, they always are um, they're opportunists. So when they see something like a carbohydrate come in, like lactose, they're going to jump right on that and start fermenting it to break it down and that fermentation byproduct creates gas, uh, methane, and hydrogen, and that's when you're going to see a lot of those symptoms like bloating, gas, abdominal cramping, um, and diarrhea, all those pleasant things. So kind of going back to the prevalence of lactose intolerance, we mentioned this a little bit in the beginning. We do actually see a lot of self-diagnoses with, uh, with lactose intolerance, so a 2009 study actually showed that uh, within the 12% reported um, by Americans that we see a demographic of European Americans, Hispanic Americans, and African Americans reporting um, a higher amount of lactose intolerance. But the interesting thing is with lactose intolerance is 54% actually haven't been diagnosed by a health professional. And that can be really uh, dangerous when it comes to the quality of your nutritional um, benefits you're receiving from your diet because if you aren't seeking the care of your health professional, you could be misdiagnosing yourself and then you're missing out on those benefits of dairy or your discomfort from food could be coming from somewhere else and you're mistakenly think it's related to dairy and um, then you're not, you're not working through that either. So you really do want to make sure that um, when you're looking at lactose intolerance that we're helping people um, achieve an optimal diet. And with lactose intolerance, we'll see here in a few slides, you can, um, from person to person, work dairy into your diet and be able to enjoy dairy and, and the benefits of dairy um, without the discomfort. In addition to the prevalence, we actually see here in this consensus statement that, you know, acknowledging that milk and milk products are really associated with decreasing that risk for chronic diseases we hear, see here in the United States, like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and the osteoporosis. And we look at this and we say, okay, if we have people that are limiting their milk and milk products because they're thinking um, that they, that's the only way to solve those discomforts associated with lactose intolerance, you're going to start seeing, um, you know, those, those nutrients, that, that great nutrient package that's associated with milk, um, really suffer in that person's diet. And, again, we can see here that it's highlighted that those, those demographics where we tend to see more lactose intolerance prevalence, these seem to be the same um, demographics where they're, they're going to be commonly consuming less levels of dairy 
um, which can add to that increased risk for those chronic diseases. Because really when we look at dairy, and Amy did a great job emphasizing this as, as well, so I'm just going to kind of continue on that, that uh, her coattails with that. When you're looking at dairy, it's not only packed with great nutrients, but it's very versatile. Um, it's delicious. That's why you find it in everything. <laughs> um, so really it's so beneficial and helpful and less stressful for people when they know they don't have to miss out on, on the great taste and nutritional benefits of dairy. Now, we talked about how a lot of times it's very self-diagnosed with people. So, one, when you're working with people that think they might have this, you want to start with making sure they actually are working with a doctor to, to get a proper diagnosis. So, this slide kind of talks about what that entails. So, you're commonly going to see uh, a hydrogen breath test and a, maybe a combination of measuring glucose levels and even the acid uh, levels in stool, mostly just because a lot of that byproduct fermentation that happens from bacteria digesting lactose once it gets in the colon isn't supposed to happen. So if you're able to look at acid levels produced from that bacteria, the hydrogen that's produced, um, along with if you have decreased glucose levels in response to lactose consumption, you're going you're gonna to start pairing those together and say, okay, we're gonna, we probably do have a lactose malabsorption um, problem because we're, we're seeing that, that heightened activity in the colon. So moving on to managing the tips of lactose intolerance. So we kind of talked about what is lactose intolerance versus milk allergy, uh, the science of it, and I've been saying, hey, you don't have to avoid it. So how do we actually do that, and how do we coach people through that? Well, as you can see here on this slide, there's lots of great tips to be able to do that. It's really important to know the baseline because everybody's different. So if you're looking at um, someone's diet and their lactose intolerance and they've been diagnosed so, and you know they can tolerate last, uh, cottage cheese, for example. You're like, okay, so this person can do really good with about three grams of lactose, so we can even work from there to do baby steps on trying to get other forms of dairy in the diet as well. And as you can see, too, if we have someone that is, is um, kind of at the one end of the spectrum of lactose intolerant, um, really starting with your harder cheeses are, is very helpful because those cheeses, the bacteria in it already kind of break down that lactose, so there's, there's very few... Uh, the amount of lactose in your harder cheeses is, is less, so that's also a good place to start. But the other tips also include, we have a really, really great line, I'm very proud of it, of lactose-free uh, fluid milk options for people. So really that just refers to the fact that that lactose is already broken down, that enzyme is already added so that people can enjoy. Um, I always think of your, your lactose-free chocolate milk post-workout. You don't have to miss out on that. Um, and you can also, as on our next slide, my favorite, because uh, I, I love anything catchy, and this is a great way to remember it, and the National Dairy Council actually, actually has a really, really great handout surrounding this infographic, is try it, sip it, stir it, slice it, shred it, and spoon it. And that's just a really fun way to remember that you have options, right? You can try the lactose-free milk products. You can um, stir it into your dishes. Um, you can really incorporate it into your other, you know, fruit and veggie, uh, grain dishes, your protein dishes. And even I think back to our presentation, uh, uh, our last presentation we had where it was on culture and fermentation, we, had, we saw some really great yogurt recipes. Those are things that you could use because uh, yogurt has that, those active cultures in it that can really help you out and be your body when it comes to digesting lactose as well. So people can still enjoy dairy and have fun with it and uh, don't, don't feel like they need to avoid it and still be able to take advantage of those awesome nutrients found in dairy. Thanks so much, Abby. You and Amy really did a great job addressing those questions that we get about what's in the dairy case, but also what to do if dairy doesn't quite sit right with you. But I want to switch gears for a minute and pose some of the questions we've received about cow care. And let's start off with antibiotics. From your perspective as a dairy farmer, can you talk to us about why dairy farmers would use antibiotics and what it means for our milk? Yes, I most certainly can. I do commonly get this question as a dairy farmer, which, one, I applaud people for actually asking a dairy farmer because a lot of people are removed from food production. And um, even myself, I recently uh, had a baby, so even being off the farm for a couple of months, I feel a little bit removed from my on-farm experience, so I can only imagine what it's like for people that have never actually been to a farm, um, kind trying to, you know, think through what it's like to actually take care of cows, it can be really difficult. So I love it when people can come out on the farm and see it firsthand, but 
still being able to be on this webinar today. We have a really great video I'm going to show you here in a couple of slides of um, one of our fellow farmers talking about antibiotics, which gives you guys some great visuals to be able to get an idea of what that's like. This is just a picture of my farm here. It's actually covered in snow right now. But uh, the first thing I always tell people when they, when they have questions about antibiotics and, and dairy products is, number one, there is absolutely no milk uh, that has antibiotics in it, no milk or milk products that have any antibiotics in it. So when you're shopping at the store, you do not have to worry about trying to sift through milk products or fluid milk and being able to try to select something that you think doesn't have antibiotics in it. Now, with that said, there are farms when an animal, unfortunately, is um, not feeling well where we have to use a course of antibiotics to be able to make her feel better. Uh, we try to use the preventative um, tools as much as possible because with cows, if you keep them feeling healthy, the farmers are feeling good and uh, they're able to make milk and uh, they'll they'll be able to be doing great and we don't have to worry about using antibiotics. But unfortunately, sometimes our cows do get sick. But the FDA does regulate not just production, but they regulate the whole entire process from milk production on the farm through processing and to the store to make sure there's checkpoints along the way that prohibit antibiotics in our milk supply. Okay, so that means at the farm, our farmers have to have SOPs in place, standard operating procedures um, that they utilize either uh, through their milk co-op and the farm program, which we'll go over a little bit in a couple of slides. And those SOPs have to include labeling use, protocol, protocol being how is that animal separated and identified that she's being treated. Um, we have to follow with hold times. We have to have a testing procedure to make sure after she is done with her course of antibiotics, we have to test her milk to make sure it is free of antibiotics before her milk can go back into our saleable milk that leaves the farm. And, and how is that management going to look so that the FDA can come on the farm uh, with their on and out inspections and be able to see that everything is um, working off of those, those standard operating procedures. So with our farm, we actually have our cows uh, separated physically from their herd mates and so that they can get more individual one-on-one -on -one care. They usually have a red leg band that they wear to identify them further, and then we also have to milk them completely separate from the herd because we have to actually dump all of their milk um, while they're on antibiotics and even up to a certain period after they're finished with those antibiotics before we can test them, make sure their milk is clear, and then be able to put them back in with their herd mates and um, resume their milk going um, off the farm to be made into milk or milk products. So with the farm program, really great resource with our farmers. Um, it's, a, it's a program that's actually implemented through our milk co-ops. And our milk cooperatives are basically um, companies that are a, our farmers are able to rely on to sell our milk for us. Farmers work really hard every day, so we don't really have a lot of time um, to sell our own milk. So a lot of our farmers re, uh, rely on these co-ops to be able to do that for us. So one of the great resources that our co-ops provide us is they also help us implement the farm program, which stands for Farmers Assuring Responsible Management. We have four silos. A little fun um, fact for you, silos are where we store a lot of our feed for our cows. So if you need any um, interesting trivia stuff for your Christmas parties coming up, you can talk about silos. Um, for the sake of this conversation, we're going to focus on the antibiotic stewardship silo. And really what that, um, that entails with the farm program is it's, auditors and program directors coming on the farm and going through making sure our SOPs make sense, streamlining them, doing training with our employees, checking everything, providing resources, online resources, and person resources to make sure that we're always looking through our SOPs to make sure they make sense for our farm and that our employees understand them and that we're following them to a T so that we can prevent, again, any antibiotics ever possibly going into our mouth that's leaving the farm. So in addition to that, with our milk regulations, like I said, the FDA monitors everything from farm to processing to plate. So even we already briefly talked about the, the farm aspect, but even with the processing plant, the FDA is regulating them and um, doing audits and inspections and even checking labeling regulations and standard identity for milk products to make sure that um, not only everything's free of antibiotics or any other concerns, but also that we're producing a high-quality milk and milk product. 
So now we're going to tee up this fun video. Hold on one second because we're buffering here. People say, oh, there's all this antibiotics in milk. Nothing could be further from the truth. There are no antibiotics in your milk, and there are tons of things that we do to make sure it doesn't happen. So we identify a sick cow, and we do that by just kind of looking like you would at your kids. You know, if they're just kind of gloomy, they're not eating much, their ears might be droopy. If we do have a sick cow, we really monitor that animal to make sure she gets well. All our employees are are working on this together as a team, but we want to make sure that there's no antibiotics in the milk. So cows get a leg band, it's bright red, it says treated on it, so that everyone knows that that cow is on antibiotics. They hook her up to a separate bucket and then it's immediately discarded. It's not used for any purpose, it's just waste milk. But then you have a withhold time because we have to make sure that there's no residue in that milk. She might be only given medicine for a short time, but she, her milk is withheld for a longer period of time. When she's done, we test her milk, parts per billion, no less, to make sure that there's no antibiotics in that milk. If we sell milk with antibiotics in it and it's found out at the plant, we pay a huge fine. It's against the law. If it happens again, you can lose your license to sell milk. It's a really big deal. Milk is tested like nine times from the farm all the way to the retail level, just to make sure every step of the way that there's no antibiotics in that milk. It's the most tested food product you can buy. Milk is so highly regulated. First thing when the truck pulls into our farm to pick up our milk, before anything is done, he samples our milk. And that's to take to the laboratory for testing. And then before the truck is ever unloaded at the milk plant, that whole truck is tested for antibiotics in parts per billion. If that truckload tests positive, they look for the culprit, which farmer is responsible. And if it's your milk, you pay for the whole truckload of milk. There's huge penalties if you sell milk with antibiotics. And that system is really working well. That whole truck then is discarded. It's not used for any processing. Our government is testing 44,000 samples every year to make sure that there is no antibiotics in any milk product at the retail level. And what they're finding, zip. There is zero antibiotics in your milk. So enjoy all your milk. It's all antibiotics. All right, and now I'm going to hand it over to Sally. Thanks so much, Abby. I think that video does a great job of illustrating the numerous steps involved in ensuring our milk is safe in the dairy case. Um, another popular topic is hormones in dairy farming and human health. So before Abby addresses hormones in dairy farming, Dr. Moises Torres-Gonzalez is going to help us understand hormones from, from a physiological perspective. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Sally. Uh, Let's talk about hormones. Uh, for different reasons, and many of them not for positive reasons, hormones have become a popular topic in food culture nowadays. But let's take a step back and let's go through a very basic overview on hormones. What are they and why are they produced? Hormones are organic substances produced by plants, animals, humans, and pretty much any living organisms. They regulate physiological activities. Essentially, they are signaling molecules that play an important role for growth, development, and reproduction in animals, for growth and immunity in plants. The most prominent type of hormones are those derived from cholesterol, such as estrogen hormones, and those that are proteins or protein derived like insulin. This is mostly in animals and humans. In plant foods, such as soy, nuts, seeds, cereal, grains, etc., the most prominent hormone-like substances are the phytoestrogens. They have hormone-like characteristics similar to the animal-based estrogens. That's why they are called phytoestrogens. And these include isoflavones, lignans, and phytoalexins. Now, hormones that are protein or protein derived, when they are eaten as a part of food, they are digested as any other protein that comes in, in the diet. 
This means that enzymes in the gastrointestinal tract digest them, releasing free amino acids mainly. Therefore, the digestion process eliminates their biological activity. So naturally occurring protein derived uh, or proteins that are hormones found in foods are not a health concern. What about esteroids hormones and phytoestrogens? Well, in general, although the evidence is still emitted, it has been shown that esteroid hormones and phytoestrogens coming from foods are poorly absorbed. And in the case of esteroid hormones, it is estimated that 90% of these very minor amount that might be absorbed is inactivated by the first pass effect on the liver. This has led to the conclusion that no hormonal effects can be expected from natural occurring esteroid hormones in foods. Now, in this slide, as you can see as an example, it is presented theoretical estimates of the amounts of naturally occurring esteroid hormones and phytoestrogens that might be consumed with a standard 2,000 calorie meal plan using generic foods amounts as recommended by the most recent dietary guidelines for Americans. As you can see, higher amount of phytoestrogens versus the other hormones foods might be available in the diet. Now, I think that when we talk about esteroid hormones, it is also helpful to provide another perspective. And this is by comparing daily production of hormones in our bodies versus those hormones that come in from foods. Here, in this slide, I'm just pointing out as an example estrogen. And this is because there have been uh, some concerns about the safety and potential health effects of these hormones, mainly when consuming animal foods like dairy. When we compare daily production versus consuming from foods, and this I'm talking about foods that are in alignment with the dietary guidelines for Americans, you will notice that premenopausal women produce anywhere from 440 to 4,500 times the estrogens found in, for example, three daily servings of dairy. Therefore, dietary estrogen contribution from dairy is insignificant. Something that I want to highlight uh, here is that the hormones values that I presented in this slide and in the previous one are rough estimates that, and are shown for informational purposes only with the aim to provide examples of levels that might be theoretically present in foods. Therefore, the values shown here should be interpreted carefully. Now, let's talk briefly about this topic. This is a uh, a myth that proliferated in the early 90s indicating that hormones in foods, and particularly in milk, might be the cause of early puberty in children. And this led to misconceptions about hormones in milk that actually current science does not support. As you saw before, the relative contribution of esteroid hormones of dairy foods is significant when we compare with, with what is produced in our bodies. In fact, there is no conclusive evidence that drinking milk or eating other dairy foods or any particular food is associated with early puberty. On the other hand, several observational studies actually link higher body mass index or increased body fatness with earlier initiation or progression of pubertal development. We have to have in mind that childhood obesity is a very serious health problem here in the U.S., and it has more than tripled since 1960s. Now, based on what I have been presenting as a bottom line, based on what is, what is this known so far, hormones and hormone-like content of, consume, of commonly consumed foods are safe according to the current safety guidelines. And there is no convincing evidence for adverse effects on health. Thanks so much, Moises. Abby, as you mentioned earlier, Cows, humans, and all living things have hormones. Can you shed some light on hormones in dairy farming for us? Sorry about that. There you all go. right, absolutely. I can um, really what I want to leave our attendees with is three main points when it comes to hormones. Hormones, uh, like with humans and cows, are used uh, to be able to send messages throughout the body. So that includes growth hormones such as bovine somatotrophin. And in the dairy industry, we actually were approved by the FDA to use a synthetic form um, to be able to help our cows with um, 
with our milk production because the natural form of BSP does regulate the cow's growth and development. So what I always like to to tell people, because three main points it's easier to remember, is one, it's safe for cows and humans. Two, it's barely utilized. The synthetic form, the RBSC, is barely utilized anymore in the U.S. And three, um, it really comes down to consumer preference. So the first one, safe for cows and humans, cows naturally produce it. So it's going to actually show up in the milk whether the farmer is using the RBSC or not. Um, because it's a naturally produced hormone that the cow is using to regulate her body. And with humans, it's safe because it's actually a species-specific um, hormone. So it's not going to be recognized by the human body, and it's also a protein hormone. So when we consume our dairy, it's going to be digested um, in the stomach like any other, um, any other protein. And then really, like I said, it comes down to consumer preference. So there's no nutritional advantage, no environmental advantage, um, or animal care advantage deciding between the two. It comes down to if that consumer um, wants to be able to, uh, to select a milk that, that has that or doesn't have it. But because the FDA has, has um, no research showing a significant difference between cows treated and not treated with it, they are really required to label those products where they're claiming or labeling free of RBSP to, to put this disclaimer on it so pe people and consumers know that there's, there's no nutritional benefit or safety concerns surrounding the difference between the two. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Abby. And one last category of questions that we get is dairy community's commitment to environmental sustainability. And um, in essence of time, I'm going to go through these slides quickly um, so we can get to some of the questions you have as well. But you will have access to these slides as well as a recording if you want to listen in more detail. When we talk about the dairy community's commitment to environmental sustainability, I think it's always important to take a step back and think th about the full four dimensions of sustainable food systems, health, environment, economics, and society. So it's all four of those working together. When it comes to dairy and health, clearly um, dairy foods have a unique nutrient package and is represented in numerous healthy eating patterns. And it's because of their contribution in the body of science that the dietary guidelines has indicated that three servings of dairy foods a day are recommended for those nine years and older. And low fat and fat free dairy foods are associated with reduced risk of several chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. When it comes to economic and social contributions, the dairy community supports nearly 3 million jobs and contributes $625 billion to the U.S. economy every year. And 95% of those dairy farms are family owned and operated. In addition, dairy foods are accessible and affordable when you look to nourishing our communities around the globe. Then when it comes to dairy and the environment, I think it's really important to note that the dairy community knows it's important that we can't measure, we can't evaluate what we don't measure and what we don't know the baseline is. So a few years ago, we actually conducted a full life cycle assessment to measure our environmental impact through a product's life cycle. And what we found was that the U.S. dairy accounts for just 2% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. And since then, the dairy community has been committed to reducing that 2% even further. Over the past 10 years, because of efficiencies and best practices like precision feeding, nutrition, water management, and methane digesters, a recent study found that producing a gallon of milk can be produced today using 21% less land, 30% less water, generating 20% less manure, and 19% less greenhouse gas than it did in 2007. Um, and we're committed to continuous progress and improvement. The studies like the one above show are making progress, but that's not our end game. In fact, the Environmental Stewardship Committee of the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy is working to develop forward-looking environmental stewardship goals, and we hope to have an update on that in 2020, so stay tuned for that. So with that, I hope we really addressed a lot of the questions that came up over the course of the year in our webinar. We've covered a lot of ground, and we really appreciate you hanging on as we went through this content. Um, I want to recommend, if you have more questions, always reach out or enter a question in the Q&A box, but also check out nationaldairycouncil.org. We have a host of research resources and recipes there. And this, I always point out this post on the right is my very favorite, Dairy A to Z. And if you think of any question you might have, we've likely have content covering that right there. 
Lastly, I want to encourage you to join the Dairy Nourishes Network to advance, get advanced notice of webinars like this, as well as quarterly newsletters and updates. And there's a link on this in the materials you'll receive later. Um, but continue to enter your questions in the chat box. But right now, we have a few that came in that I want to get to right away. So, Amy, first off, someone actually called out a good find for us on your graph about does organic milk differ from conventional milk? Yes. And I think we have just a little typo there. Um, can, should we advance to the slide? I'm working on it. Okay. Hang tight. <laughs> Okay, so while we're going to the slide, there's a box at the bottom of the slide that we need to correct, and here we go. So we talked about the rich source of omega-3 fatty acids that fish um, provide, and so that second sentence in the box should say, as such, it does not make a significant contribution, milk that is, to the recommended levels as compared to foods like salmon. Awesome. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, thank you. We always love our listeners and participants. Fantastic. So, um, in addition, Amy, can you tell us, we have a question on, does UHT change the flavor or nutrients in milk? Um, no. So, the it, although some people do say that they think UHT milk tastes differently or can perceive a cook taste to it, I've heard that before, but if you look at the nutrients across um, the nutrients are, are stable across the different types of thermal processing that's done. And, and that ties into another question about low temperature. So really pasteurization is a function of the temperature versus the time. So the lower temperature you go, the longer time you need to get to that kill step that's required for pasteurization. So uh, any combination of those um, that gets you to that kill step will work. Fantastic, thank you. Abby, we also have a question for you. Um, is, is, is the antibiotic claim of no milk contains antibiotics true of factory farms too? Uh, great question. Um, again, our participants have awesome questions today. So one, uh, I don't, I, I'm assuming they're referring to larger farms, um, just mostly because sometimes perceive uh, the word factory farm as a farm that's not family owned and I can assure you being a large farmer that our our farm is ran very similar to a smaller farm so we usually like to just differentiate between small medium large but um, as far as um, antibiotics and making sure that um, it's, it's not present in any of the the milk products you're buying the FDA ha requires a farm of any size. It does not matter how big they are. If they are shipping milk to be sold um, into fluid milk consumption or milk product consumption, they have to operate off of, the, off of those um, farm program or whatever their milk co-op um, requirements are in addition to FDA requirements. And they're all inspected to make sure and assure that antibiotics does not enter our food supply no matter the size of the farm. Thank you so much for that, Abby. That's um, really good additional content. Um, and I want to recognize that we're at time right now, and thank you so much for spending the past hour with us. Um, we've received over 100 questions today, which really gives us a lot of content for future webinars as well. So if you liked this kind of FAQ approach, let us know, and we love to build these around what you're interested in and what you're looking for. So um, you can let us know through the chat here or by uh, the survey that you'll receive um, soon. So really, we're looking forward to connecting with you in 2020. And again, thanks so much for spending an hour out of your day with us.